Okay, guys, we'll give it a couple more minutes before we kick off just to see if anyone else is going to join us today. Okay, I'm um, happy to kick off now if, if we're comfortable as many people as possible have, have signed in. Um, we've got 10 in the room, so that's fairly um, good number for our group. So to start with, um, I'll just run through the agenda quite quickly. I've had no requests to update the agenda from the template, so it'll be our standard, um, what's our, who's our note taker, um, invites and discussions and updates from the authors, and then discussions of items and issues. Um, that have come up in the mailing list. I think the main one, um, I think Rama has been handling. Um, I'm not sure if Rama's here. He is. Um, brilliant. So Rama, I'm probably going to invite you to, to talk for a moment or two um, on the ISO 2022 standards that you've been working on, as well as the other um, elements that have been happening. So without further ado, can I nominate, can I ask someone to volunteer as note taker, please? I can take notes. Thank you, Alex, appreciate that. So kicking off then, um, Thomas, would you like to um, give us an update um, and your takeaways from how the working group went last week? Or week before? Gosh, it's been two weeks. But so you mean the uh, meeting in Yokohama? Yes. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I was hoping it would be an uneventful meeting and I think it was an uneventful meeting in the sense that there were no shocking revelations or anything like that but but for those who uh, did dial in and and sort of got bored uh, the purpose purpose was also to provide some kind of a semi tutorial semi explanation to many people who are new to this work and and there were some people in the room who are local Japanese folks who were new to this and, and that's why I went through the slides that you're you are already familiar with, you've seen before. Um, and I think in terms of uh, action items, a couple of things stood out. Uh, there was a comment from John Levine about comparing with ISO 200, uh, I, I need to say it the correct way, 2020 or something like that. Uh, and, um, and I think that would be a good idea for us to do anyway, because it is, a uh, an ISO standard that's being adopted and deployed widely by the banking community, uh, and I think it's it's part of the you know open banking PSD um, sort of development that's that's been happening. So um, I, I you know I, I don't know who's going to do that. I mean I'm I'm happy to you know to to get help. I, I'm happy to you know look at you know how we compare against uh, that ISO 220 standard, but I would need um, assistance. Uh, let's just say, and um, I think, I don't know where we're going to put the text, but I believe Claire and Wes, I think we thought we'd put it somewhere in the architecture document. Uh, yes, I think so that was, that was one AI. Yeah, I think that was what was suggested in the yeah. um, working group was that it probably lived in the architecture document in terms of um, other 
protocols that were out there that we were comparing to and why we feel that the ISO 2022s, um, or however you pronounce it, don't quite um, cover the elements needed. I think, um, forgive me if I'm wrong, I'm thinking even Raphael or Rama have started that conversation and I know John's gone back on some of it. Great. Great, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> that was that. So I was hoping that, that we've already started discussion. And I, I, I do know some people, you know, even you know, on this call today, uh, you know, at least the companies have people who are, you know, participating or even using that standard. So that's it's a mm -hmm. it's a good sort of you know community to to answer the question. Um, I think the other own uh, the only other thing. Um, is that I need to fix a typo in the message flow uh, diagram. I think just the mis misnumbering. I think two point step two point three two point four needs to be relabeled, but but that's kind of about it. And I will do that today and upload it as version seventeen of the message flow diagram. Okay, Fabulous. that that's uh, that's <laughs> that's. I, what, that's what I jotted, jotted down in my notes as as to do. Did did I miss anything, uh, Claire, Wes, or, or folks? No, I think that was the, the main sort of takeaway. I know we had um, a fairly quiet session, but we did have some new faces in the room, which was which was quite um, encouraging. Um, I know that a lot of people struggled to make it due to the time zone difference. So so thank you to those that could. Um, did anyone have any questions about how the uh, Yokohama working group went um, or anything they wanted to add to the agenda? I know we've had something um, come through in the last 20 minutes, um, which of course we can we can come to in the end um, from Rama, so we can absolutely get around to that if we've got time. Does anyone else have any um, agenda nits to add? Um, I guess all, all, the only other thing on the Yokohama uh, meeting was, I guess, what was the general reception? Um, you, you mentioned that, okay, people mentioned that we should compare with ISO 2022, but anything else in terms of was it was it positive? Did, did people understand the problem space? I, I had a, you know, private, I, afterwards I met, I met some folks, um, at, you know, who, are, who were there, one, one person was there and, and another person was from a different company, but uh, they, they are interested so, so th there's a bigger picture going on that's been going on for the last two years, which is that you've heard all this news about um, different um, governments trying out, you know, exploring CBDC and CBDC networks. But th th there are several efforts that are trying to do multi CBDC networks. So what that means is that you have a like a DLT um, that actually has multiple, you know, fiat backed uh, currency tokens you know, running, you know, and it's a, it's a private permission network, of course, needless to say. So, so some folks in Japan are looking at, you know, exploring that. And the question I had as well, like, how, how does, how does SATP work there? Uh, can, um, you know, can you move an asset from, you know, one network to another? And what would be the use case for this? Because, because it's now, um, it's not like tokenized physical assets. It is now, um, you know, something like a like a currency, a, a government issued currency, and and my my quick answer to that was that yes, you know, we could we certainly could do that, and I think I was emailing Rama earlier that I would like to add a use case or sub use case of the CBDC section in the use cases document to explain how this multi CBDC could be addressed using SATP. Yeah, I think. Uh... Raphael had a paper on CBDC um, in the context of SATP, or rather SATP in the context of CBDCs. But yeah, yeah, it sounds like a good use case to put in, definitely. Uh, Dennis, uh, you've got your hand up. Hello, hello everyone. Uh, Yes, I mean, if we brought a bit the, the picture that uh, Thomas was just explaining, maybe the case that we have fungible tokens both sides that are exchanged, it's something that probably we should uh, have a look at. Uh, because we assume, or maybe it's my understanding, that in the flow diagram that we have now in version 17, 
we have like creating and destroying assets, which is okay for uh, non-fungible, but we should probably see if there is some difference in the case that we have non-fungible, uh, fungible assets, sorry, uh, in the exchange. Absolutely. I think this speaks to sort of the, the overarching uh, scope in that our solution should be agnostic to whichever assets are being transferred. So it's definitely worth making sure that any solution that we've come up with and the solution we have so far is applicable. Um, that's definitely something we should probably check off. Um, thank you for that, Dennis. Dennis is agreeing to review <laughs> the, the, the text. Thank you, Dennis. <laughs> um, and that, no problem. That does bring me on to something else that was part of the agenda in the working group. And I don't know how many people have been able to read the minutes um, and some of the takeaways. And one of those takeaways, um, Wes and I will, will send a communicate to the, the working group, uh, to the mailing list regardless, was to have a discussion. We had a, we had a vote in the room, um, which came away positive in terms of are the documents as is um, ready for adoption. Now, adoption, for those that don't know, means that as a working group, we agree that the documents we have listed so far are the right starting point to take through the IETF process in terms of having it all approved, having it peer, peer reviewed, and then ultimately um, agreed, published and, and deployed. So um, we will put that on the mailing list. So if I could ask everyone to come back and put a vote on that, um, we can then take our current um, working documents and have them as official working group documents, um, which is part one of the process, which is part of it. If you um, want to have a look, if you go on to the data tracker, I think the um, agenda slides are still up there. So you can have a look. There's a, there's a flow bar, um, sort of a process chart in terms of how documents are moved through the process and what steps they need to go through. So as a point of discussion, um, does, has everyone read the documents? Are they all comfortable with the documents? Is there anything that people want to call out now um, that would, in their minds, prevent the documents from being um, adopted as a starting point as is? Um, yeah, so with the documents, we uh, I think a few weeks ago, we talked about this vocabulary document at um, Dennis and I have been contributing to, and also Thomas and Rama. Um, it's currently just on GitHub. Do we want to make it an official document as part of our, um, I guess, folder? Uh, so we can upload it on the ITF website and include it uh, alongside the drafts? Or are we OK with just having it as an informal uh, page on GitHub? Uh, so the working group does have an official repository, um, which is a good place to store documents. And we can have the repository moved there. And then uh, once it's, it's typically we do that after it's uh, accepted as a as a working group document. So uh, Claire and I will start that call, you know, the official call after um, the meeting ends. And it'll take, you know, two weeks. And we'll ask for input on the working group mailing list. And I'm sure it'll be accepted. but. You know, officially, we go through a two-week process of, of making sure everybody agrees that this is the right direction for the working group to go, and these are the right starting documents, and yada, yada, yada. And then, um, yeah, we can move that GitHub repository to the official working group. One is definitely the right thing to do. OK, thanks, Wes. Awesome. So if I could. Back to the agenda. Um, if there are no further updates and discussions from the authors, um, happy to move on to the um, item that Rama uh, mentioned in the mailing list. Uh, Claire, maybe maybe I can step up quickly. Yes, please. Um, I've been updating the uh, or suggesting some updates to Core regarding error messages. I think it would be useful to have, for us to have a discussion on that. Um, currently, the suggested updates are on GitHub, and I've shared them on the mailing list. OK, would you like to lead the discussion now, or is that discussion you'd like to have on the mailing list? I think we can take it to the mailing list. 
yeah, if that's if that's how you would prefer to have the discussion, absolutely. Would you be okay summarizing that the comment about the error messages just so that we're all on the same page? Yeah, so so the the idea is for us to come up with uh, an error schema for all the messages that set be defines, such that um, in case of failure, the gateways can employ an error handling uh, protocol. Currently, we are only handling success cases, and we want to handle errors as well. So that that's essentially it. I think that would be fairly viable. That was a comment that was made in the working group. I believe I can't remember who made it, but there was a comment made about um, what happens if it goes wrong. So that would make it that would fit quite nicely. Thank you. Yep. Fab. Well, happy to hand over control then to Rama. Um, if you'd like to share your screen, Rama. So. Uh... It's actually going to be Bishak, who's also on the call, who will present. But just before uh, we turn to that topic, uh, since you asked about the comparison with ISO 2002, uh, I saw that uh, uh, Thomas and John had an, uh, a short email exchange. And uh, I, I do plan to uh, write something more substantial on the, email, on the mailing list uh, at some point. Just haven't had the time since the working group. But I will definitely do so. So I replied to Wes after that uh, after the meeting uh, the main uh, i think the high level takeaway is that uh, iso 2002 is a uh, it offers a standard standardized messaging format um, now the semantics of those messages don't really cover the semantics that we wish to achieve with satp which is the extinguishing of an asset from uh, in one network and the recreation of a of a basically a replica in another so the messages in ISO 2002 are really um, promises. Uh, so in a sense, they, they serve a valuable purpose and we definitely need to compare with them. But uh, I think the, uh, the difference between uh, the ISO 2002's goals and SATP's goals are quite clear. But anyway, I'll write something more substantial in the mailing list uh, sometime soon. Uh, so uh, what uh, the item that I wanted to uh, bring up in today's meeting was uh, there's a paper that uh, uh, we wrote uh, uh, that was accepted at NDSS uh, 2023 uh, that was held in San Diego about a month ago. And uh, the topic of the paper was uh, a new kind of a privacy preserving cryptographic mechanism, which uh, the need for which grew out of our the research we've been doing in interoperability, specifically how to uh, permission networks can um, establish a trust basis with each other, given that they are completely opaque to each other, uh, and uh, using uh, decentralized identity infrastructure. Um, so from that, we we got to thinking about um, uh, whether when uh, two parties have a, a bunch of different uh, uh, certificates from different certificate authorities, uh, they, uh, they they can arrive at a common uh, um, uh, at, at some uh, common notion of trust, if they know who their common certifying authorities are, their common certificate authorities are, but if they reveal anything more, that might lead to a privacy violation. So, can we devise a cryptographic mechanism that reveals only what's the, in the intersection and nothing outside? That'd be great. So, we think this can be applied to a lot of different things, including the kind of problems that uh, this group has been talking about, SATP and also the uh, the view exchanges that uh, I've brought up, uh, as, as you all know. So uh, I'll turn it over to Bishak. Uh, I think we can he can cover this uh, within 15, 20 minutes. So we have a short version of the presentation. So, uh, but are there any uh, questions before we uh, before I turn it to Bishak? I think Raphael. Okay, Bishak. About what the paper oh. is in more detail. Ah, so Rafael, check out the, uh, I uh, posted the link on the mailing list. Just check it out. Thank you. I can post the link here as well. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Hello. So uh, I will try to share my screen and see if that works first. Uh, Uh, 
can you see my screen no i just screen share is being started i don't know if anyone else has got a different view that's what i'm obviously okay i will try again maybe. Mm -hmm. Is it visible now? No. This uh, portal is a bit new to me. Okay, I will try. Uh, maybe I will quickly design. Uh, Can you share the? Maybe share your full okay. screen. Yeah, I'm trying. That. Uh, can you see it? Or is no. it still seen? We had some problems the last time as well, right? Does anybody remember how we solved the problem? I think that was when there was a multiple screen share happening at the same time, which we don't seem to be having now. Wes, do you know why we're struggling to share the screen? Oh, there we go. We've got okay, it. Yeah. Oh, See, okay. it's just spoken about out loud. There you go. <laughs> Okay, uh, so it's visible now, right? Okay. Uh, so, yeah, uh, hello everyone. So, uh, sorry for that. Uh, so, the paper, Rafael, the, the, the title of the paper is uh, Private Certified Intersection, and this got published in uh, NDSS conference this year. So, uh, the idea of the paper, as Rama mentioned, is to uh, find out a common certifier between two parties uh, in a privacy preserving way. So uh, to uh, give, you a, give you an idea about uh, uh, how they, this can be useful, let us go through one uh, scenario. So uh, let, let us say that there are two uh, companies, uh, say a supplier and a distributor, S1 and S2. And uh, these two businesses might uh, need to collaborate, cooperate on in something. Suppose S1 needs uh, X and maybe S2 has that and uh, vice versa, S1, S1 might be able to supply something to S2. So uh, uh, looks like that uh, the, this can be a basis, basis of uh, a business relationship between them and they can strike a deal. Uh, but the point is that uh, uh, what if uh, one of the companies uh, defrauds the other? So, uh, and if associating with the other company is at all a good idea? So that is the uh, that is often the question uh, that they face. So, uh, so the way this question can be answered is by finding out if there is somebody who uh, trusts one company and that that entity is also trusted by the other company. So, is somebody associated with us? also associated with them if the answer is yes then uh, the deal sounds safe enough uh, if no then no deal so in in such a scenario the objective is to find uh, a common entity uh, who is trusted by both of them so here for example in this case there there might be some common entities like that so suppose government agency b uh, is a body who is trusted by both of them but they need to find out that that indeed uh, that is uh, there is some entity common entity and uh, we call this common uh, entity a trust anchor so uh, this find after finding out such common trust anchor the trust basis for the deals can be uh, established uh, but only if these common uh, trust anchors are revealed but while determining such common trust anchors it might happen that some other organization such as uh, say a political party uh, m uh, who is 
trusted by S1 but not by S2 is also revealed. So uh, by uh, revealing such uh, trusted entities who might not be trusted by the other company or other organization, uh, 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 it can cause a privacy breach. So uh, if a different certifier will uh, was revealed, then the deal may fall through or even worse, uh, uh, a company might get some business advantage by getting to know some of the private contacts of the other company. So we can see that uh, finding out such common trust anchors in a privacy reserving way is a really important uh, objective here. So uh, if you think about the uh, uh, broader objective of uh, decentralized identity management uh, in the context of uh, uh, Web3, so the idea of decentralized identifiers and verifiable credentials are uh, already getting popular. So these two are uh, W3C recommendations and DEETs or decentralized identifiers lets users uh, create, own and control their own identifiers. But DEETs are not uh, by default or by design uh, connected to any real world identity. Uh, instead, uh, what can be used are verifiable credentials, which are digital credentials, uh, which can be issued to DEETs. And these credentials make claims about the deed holder and these claims, uh, these credentials can be selectively exposed through a verifiable presentation process. So there are uh, issuers who issue verifiable credentials and holders who hold them. And then they, the holders can selectively present uh, certain credentials to verifiers. But uh, there is a problem uh, in this entire process. So suppose S1 wants to present a verifiable credential to S2. So this particular verifiable credential would have been issued by certain issuer, right? So the issuer is the certifier who is certifying a certain claim about S1 and S1 is presenting that claim to S2. Uh, so while doing so, uh, S1 is inherently revealing in, in the process, the process in, is inherently exposing the issuer of this particular verifiable credential. So the certifier is revealed as well as the claim and vice versa in the other way around also it will happen. So whoever is presenting a verifiable credential first uh, ends up revealing the uh, certifier. So uh, there is an intrinsic asymmetry in this pro procedure where uh, whoever is presenting first will uh, end up losing privacy. And our objective in this paper is to uh, is privacy preserving uh, symmetric exposure of certifiers as well as certificates. So uh, we, we try to answer this question that can parties owning certificates, uh, can parties owning certificates efficiently identify a common set of certifiers without leaking anything else? So uh, there are two parties and uh, they have certain certificates. So P1 and P2 are the two parties. P1 has some certificates from different certifiers and P2 has some other certificates from other certifiers. So the objective is to uh, efficiently identify a common set of certifiers such that the certificates issued by those certifiers attesting to some claim about the party is valid. So the certificate has to be valid. So PCI or private certifier intersection, we call uh, the solution to this problem as private certifier intersection uh, allows two or more parties to identify a common set of certifiers while validating the certificates without leaking any information about the certifiers which are not in the output intersection. So for example, in this case, certifier D, certifier C, which are uh, not in common between the two parties is not revealed. Okay. And uh, we follow a thread model that participants can be malicious and they uh, can tend to lie about their certificate authorities, basically their inputs and they might want to deviate from the protocol that we propose. And the additional goal is, of course, the protocol must be efficient enough to be used in practice. Uh, so there are existing pro uh, cryptographic concepts such as private set intersection or PSI, which is something similar, which computes the uh, intersection of uh, two input sets without revealing the elements which are not there in the intersection. So, but PCI is something different to PSI. So if we think, uh, if we try to answer this question, can PCI use PSI as a building block? Then we will uh, find out that it will only work 
if the parties are semi honest and not actually malicious if the parties are malicious then psi uh, using psi as a black box will not work because uh, private set intersection does not or is not sufficient enough to check the validity of the certificates and uh, one what one party can do in that case is just uh, input some invalid certificates from all possible certifiers it knows and certifiers are often well known entities so even if it did not have certificates from all those well known entities it can put invalid certificates and psi is incapable of validating those certificates uh, so i will just brief over this term so we came up with three variants of pci protocol pci any pci any dc and pci all so the main difference is uh, uh, a certificate can be on top of one claim or uh, multiple claims so uh, how do we uh, so we we in some use cases we might want to validate one claim in some use cases we might want to validate all all the claims so pci any uh, finds out common certifiers which attest at least one claim about the parties whereas pci all uh, attest uh, finds out common certifiers which attests all public claims about the parties and pci any dc is same as pci any but here the claims are actually revealed while uh, running pci so the values of this, those claims are revealed but the value of the uh, but the identity of the certifiers which are not they are in the intersection is not revealed so the certifiers privacy is uh, there uh, so uh, these are some of the key contributions that we came up these are all technical contributions of the paper so Uh, we introduced uh, a formal definition of pci in the simplified usable composability framework which enables using pci as a building block for larger applications in a composable manner so if you can think of any application which needs the functionality of pci where two parties need to find out a common certifier without revealing the identities of their other certifiers which are not in common then pci can be used and uh, the definitions uh, uh, prove that it uh, it can be used in a secure way and then we propose two practically efficient pci protocol solutions for pci using uh, ecds signature scheme and bls signature scheme so ecds is of course a very popular standard and bls is now po popular in many blockchain applications so in order to achieve uh, these particular implementations we you had a major contribution which is extending the uh, speeds secret sharing protocol for elliptic curve pairing operations so uh, i will just skip these parts uh, we implemented two party protocols for two party pci protocols for ecds as well as bls certificates uh, we also show that uh, in in the paper that these two party protocols where two parties find out their common certifiers can be extended to n party scenario so in a multi party pci more than two participants uh, would find out the common certifier between them without revealing the uh, ones which are not in common uh, so um, this is the overall flow of how pci works so there are two parties and they have certain claims claim a b and then uh, the these claims are attested by different certifiers say certifier a certifier b here and same, similarly in this end also certifier a and c so from the input set we can see that the certifier a is uh, common between them and there there are multiple claims involved so i am going to uh, going through a simplified overview of the pci all protocol which actually validates all the claims from these two parties so what happens is in pci all the first step is to aggregate signatures from a certifier over all the claims so this is only possible uh, with bls signature scheme where we use bls signature aggregation so uh, these input sets are then uh, reduced to one input for one unique certifier and then this goes as an input to the mpc protocol which is an extension of uh, mp speeds uh, which is an implementation of the speeds protocol so here uh, what the mpc protocol does it, it actually checks the uh, it validates the uh, signatures 
input signatures, the aggregated input signatures. And only if the uh, signatures are, are valid, then the certifiers are matched. And only the intersection, which is the set of common certifiers, is revealed uh, outside the MPC box. So the MPC outputs the common certifier. And no information about the other certifier. So in this case, certifier C from second party and certifier B from the first party are revealed. And uh, to uh, analyze the feasibility of uh, using PCI in practice, we actually uh, deployed our implementation in a, uh, in a global setup where we deployed uh, our PCI instances in a, a PCI protocol in AWS instances. Uh, and the instances are also uh, uh, fairly small. So eight core CPU and eight GB RAM, uh, which uh, is near about what, what commodity hardware these days are. And uh, we deployed uh, uh, parties placed in three data centers across two continents, one in West Coast, one in East Coast, and another one in India. And we can see that uh, for uh, growing number of certifiers, uh, the time taken to compute the intersection is actually fairly large in terms of seconds. So it takes for a uh, number of so for example, here, the number of certifiers is 100. And uh, we can see that it takes 50 seconds or, or so. So, uh, and if the latency is large, so for example, in case of WAN, uh, where one party is in US West Coast, one party is in East Coast, it takes 100 seconds. Uh, but still, it is usable in practice. And maybe it can be further uh, optimized further to reduce the overall time. But we can see that with the uh, changing number of claims. So if the number of claims are increased, then the BLS implementation of PCI is unaffected by the number of change in uh, number of claims in the inputs. Uh, so if the number of claims grow, go, grows from one to 100, the ECDS implementation uh, gets worse, but for the BLS PCI all, it stays consistent because of that signature aggregation optimization that we did. And similar trends are there for the overhead. So uh, these are the communication bandwidths used for computing PCI for 100 certifiers and changing number of claims. And this is the memory consumption. So from the memory, we can see that it can be used in commodity hardware. And the bandwidth is also reasonable. So uh, in context of the interoperability uh, uh, work that we were doing uh, in Weaver. So if so, we were trying to uh, uh, make two separate blockchain networks, uh, allow two separate blockchain networks, swap and transfer assets and share le uh, ledger data with authenticity proofs. So this private-private blockchain interoperability actually relies on uh, the ability to prove and verify claims about ledger states and consensus, which then relies on the ability to uh, verify uh, the authenticity of signatures uh, which are generated through the consensus process in each of these blockchain networks. So uh, we came up uh, with a, a two-layer architecture where uh, one layer is uh, concerned about the transfer of assets and data from one blockchain network to another, and we are validating those proofs, but that depends on the identity layer, which is concerned about uh, syncing the identity information of the foreign networks. So the keys and certificates on the basis of which the signatures can be validated. And uh, that then uh, relies on uh, the deed and verifiable credential specifications. But syncing foreign network information requires, uh, in, a in a trusted way, requires the presence of a common certifier. And here, uh, the role of PCI is evident. So, in the identity plane, PCI can be used to determine that common certifier in between the two blockchain networks in a privacy preserving way, where uh, the both the blockchain networks don't need to actually expose its, its entire list of certifiers. So there can be, of course, many future directions like implementing multi-party PCI and optimizing it further and then supporting many more signature schemes uh, such as BBS plus, et cetera. Uh, so yeah, this was the overall uh, description of uh, the paper and PCI. And 
if you have any questions or if you have any thoughts on how this could be uh, useful in practice in different projects. So I, I guess Thomas has some questions. Yeah, Thomas has a couple of questions. I think uh, just broadly, th thanks, Bishak. It's a great presentation. Uh, I uh, just trying to think through Thomas' questions, but uh, overall, uh, the the main role that at least we envisioned, and which is where uh, the uh, the motivation for PCI actually sprung originally, was how do we get uh, different networks, especially of the permission variety, to be able to uh, uh, discover and make first contact with each other. So uh, we, we uh, at least in the uh, we feel this has a role to play in the discovery uh, part of it. Uh, and uh, just uh, trying to read through the question. So, who can be the best issuers and gateway owners be issuers? Potentially, I mean, we'll have to think about that. Uh, I think in our case, the issuers, uh, when you're talking about issuers, they are the issuers of certificates. So, the certificates uh, are being issued by um, entities that are actually external to uh, the, the, uh, the ledgers on which the assets are being maintained. So they're sort of neutral third parties in a sense. Um, I don't see any reason why gateways cannot be uh, issuers, but we'll have to think through the plus model there. So, so it's and it's I back to the, the original um, VC model. Uh, oh, th thanks, Vishak. That's an interesting presentation. So, so the 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 in the VC model, an issuer says that Thomas owns this this asset in this network. Right, and if it's if it's a private network, yeah, yeah. then you have, that's to really... believe, you have to believe the issuer. And so, mm -hmm. you know, the issuer could be a third party. It could be a gateway owner that says, based on my reading of the, you know, network data, yes, th this this person claiming to hold this, you know, address indeed holds, you know, this asset. But but the 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 for question A, you know, Bishak and. Rama, the idea is that, you know, I'd like to tell the world I've got this asset without revealing my identity. Yes. And then and people that's, if, that's if, great interested in come, yeah. come to this come to this network if you want to buy it. Yeah, I, I think that'd be a great application. I think it's in fact something that we should uh, properly apply uh, the protocol to and see what what we need to do to, to make sure uh, make that happen. Yeah, that, great. Thanks for that, uh, Thomas. That's where we want to go with this. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for um, the presentation and for sharing that insight with us. Um, can I ask in terms of context of the SATP scope that we have currently, um, where you see this sitting? Is this something that um, you're pegging as, as a potential kind of future road to investigate? Um, or was this sort of a, a more kind of helping people inform, inform their thinking, just so I can understand the context of, of this, just so that research in the context of the SATP scope? Yeah, it's more towards the latter. I think this is something that, uh, because SATP is, uh, you know, we, we make a lot, we uh, elide a lot of issues, like uh, what is what exactly is the legal status of the gateways and so on, right? So SATP is focused on a, on a small portion of the, uh, of the asset pipeline uh, when it comes to cross network uh, interaction. So this is something which we are, we, yeah, we just want to inform the community about that there is research here and we have we come up with a novel mechanism to achieve a particular goal and uh, we may find it useful in the future. So um, some, if we, yeah. That's, that's really useful. I think Thomas has um, put in the chat some ideas of how that could support our current SATP goals. So in terms of the, the issue of the assertion going into the VC data structure, um, and again, we can obviously use that to inform our thinking about how we might approach this moving forward. Would you say that the um, approach that you presented, um, which was it was really in-depth, so thank you again, um, was something that would be agnostic across any network type, or would that be something that would be specific to gateway, to sort of blockchain gateway to gateway? No, it, uh, we are trying to make it agnostic. The only thing is, uh, I think they will have to, um, uh, yeah, they will have to follow the existing uh, cryptographic protocols and use uh, well-known uh, certificate formats. So uh, 
Bishak alluded to an extension in the uh, final slide about future work. So we're trying to uh, extend this to see uh, to fit to verifiable credentials which are being standardized in the W3C. So uh, if we uh, if we achieve that, then we'll have a larger range of credentials uh, that that can uh, support this uh, protocol. But then again, the the gateways will need to conform to those standards. So the gateways will need to conform to the W3C uh, recommendations. Yeah, what Dennis said. Uh, yeah, that's true. I mean, it it is. I mean, it, we should not think like it is tied to DIDs or verifiable credentials. The protocol itself is applicable wherever digital signature based credentials are involved, and where we want the uh, signer, we we want to parties to determine the signer without uh, revealing the entire list of signers of their credentials. So uh, we don't need to actually adopt uh, DIDs for issuers, but uh, the, if the if you are thinking that the issuers are signing credentials with digital signatures, then of course the issuers would have their public keys and private keys. And uh, PCI would find out the intersection of the public keys of the issuers without uh, revealing all of the issuers. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, thanks for correcting me there, Vishak. Yeah. So uh, just to clarify, uh, then I think uh, if one side is using DIDs and VCs, then I guess the other side will also need to comply with the, the same spec. But otherwise, what Vishak said, uh, you know, it's more general in scope than DIDs. Yeah, correct. So so in, in your view, do you think that uh, gateways could be issuers? Or it's not? I, I don't think so. But I mean, just to make sure. Sorry, Dennis, who are you asking that question to? Yeah, I mean, to, to Rama, sorry. Uh, so in my view, um, issuers may not be gateways. So there is no direct link between gateways and issuers, right? Uh, no, I mean, the issuers, uh, if you're talking about certificate issuers, they are uh, supposed to be external uh, to, the, uh, to the asset mm -hmm. managers. Yeah. Good, yeah, okay. That's what I thought, yeah. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I'd really like to see, or it would be interesting to see kind of the, the su suggested proposals for text in the documentations um, that, that stem from that research in terms of how we might apply that for the SATP. Um, so thank you. Um, with that in mind, we've got 11 minutes left. Left, sorry. Um, it's the end of a long day after a bank holiday weekend here, so I'm <laughs> getting to the end of my day. Um, so is there anything else that people wanted to bring up, mention, or feel they haven't had a chance to cover off, um, whether in relation to, to the presentation we've just had or anything else that we've talked about today? Uh, one quick point for me, actually. Uh, if you guys wouldn't mind sending a link to the slides to your presentation, too, or I don't think the NDSS uh, videos are recorded yet, too, but or uh, published yet, but that would be uh, fantastic to send that to the mailing list as well. Some people find slides easier to read than an academic paper. Actually, there is also a YouTube video that... Uh, I, will the the link, has... uh, I will post the link to that video on the mailing Great. List. Thank you very much. Dennis, you have your hand up. One uh, issue that, I mean, one thing that was related to the previous discussion item about error uh, messages. Mm -hmm. I was planning also to send that, and I will do uh, just after our uh, meeting on, on the uh, the comment from Rafael. Uh, I believe that in order to be exhaustive, we should discuss. I mean, maybe model the S the SAT protocol using uh, something which is not an instance diagram like the flow that we have here, but more like a state uh, modification diagram that captures all the different possible states of a gateway. That way, we would be able to be exhaustive also in our error cases and eventually all the rollback cases as well. Um, this is something that I was, you know, trying to make my. <laughs> from time to time, I, I come back to that. But I believe that in order to make sure that we don't forget any cases, we should turn our modeling to state charts rather than instance flow diagrams. But maybe it's just me. I don't know what you think about that as a group.
I think Thomas has put in the chat that um, a state machine would be useful. Um, and Raphael is asking what type of model would be used for that. Any, I mean, uh, we could use UML uh, state diagrams or, or, or anything that is more formal than uh, uh, normal flow flow chart things. But I mean, it's up to you to decide. I would, you know, rather go with state charts because they have some uh, theory behind in the UML state charts. But uh, again, that that's me. I think that would be very useful to exhaust the state space um, in our protocol, which we, I think, still don't have a very clear vision uh, on what can go wrong. Um, so that, that seems like a good idea. Uh, let's follow up on that. So I'll post something on the, uh, with, on the group and then we can eventually see if we can have like a small subgroup uh, to do that if you want. I don't know what would be your, your views. Yeah, a quick comment on that. I mean, uh, the yeah, I think some kind of an analysis would be very good. I don't know if we need to be too formal about this. Uh, we have two sides, right? And then we have they can be in one of it seems three states, maybe more if we take into account errors. Uh, we just need to I think pair them, right? And then we if we can can enumerate them should be a pretty short enumeration, and then we can analyze them. I think. Um, uh, if if we want to do a really formal analysis, uh, uh, I don't know if the I mean we've been as uh, Bishak mentioned we use the universal composability framework for the for this protocol and we are trying to do apply that to other security protocols too. So maybe that could be useful. Yeah, why not? We can start uh, the uh, the discussion and then whatever uh, you know suggestion that can improve that yeah would be really cool. Yeah, that's that's a good idea because um, yeah, we, we, for SAT core, yeah, we we need a you know list of possible errors and error message numbers to be shown in the you know in the document. Um, so yeah, yeah, and I think we need to to get there. I think we need to understand like all possible you know states, and so having some kind of a state picture, you know, would be would be useful. Super, thanks. Brilliant. Um, so have we got that action captured, Alex, in terms of, of starting a new conversation? We will check it. <laughs> OK, um, anything else in the last seven minutes at all? OK, well, um, happy to call it there. Thank you everyone for coming along and for the um, contribution to the discussion. It was a really good meeting. Um, Alex, I'm sure will send the notes out in um, a short period of time and we will share with you an upload to uh, Data Tracker for, um, oh, we've got one more chat panel, Sonny. Oh, thank you, Thomas. <laughs> okay, cheers everyone. And we will speak officially in um, a month's time. Obviously, um, we'll be using the mailing list between now and then to capture the decisions around adopting the papers and the um, new conversation about the state diagram for the gateways. Thank you very much. Speak to you then.